Uh, on behalf of President Dries Wawisha, who could not uh, join us today for this presidential lecture, I am pleased to uh, welcome you all uh, to the talk by Professor Nidal Gesum from the American University of Sharjah uh, about why Arab world universities should adopt the liberal education model. Uh, Professor Gesum is not uh, is very well known to our students here. He has been intervening and interacting with our students several times through different opportunities. And over the last few times, it was through the courses of Dr. Bigliardi. So it's a pleasure to finally have him here on Cher et on Us in person to uh, address our students and our community. So it is uh, a pleasure and an honor to have you here, sir. And I will give the floor to Dr. Bigliardi, who will uh, introduce you br very briefly before we give you the floor. Uh, this evening, we are playing host to Professor Nidal Gesum. He's an Algerian astrophysicist. He received his PhD degree from the University at Calif of California at San Diego. Uh, he has been at the American University of Sharjah uh, in the Emirates since 2000 and uh, he has served as chair of the physics department. He has been associate dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and president of the faculty senate. In addition to dozens of technical papers in top astrophysical journals, he has published extensively on issues of science, education, culture, Islam and the Arab world. Um, I know him uh, through Islam's quantum question. He's a monograph published in 2011, but I should also mention the book he just published, The Young Muslim's Guide to Modern Science, uh, and I'm personally very grateful for this because it will spare me a lot of preparation. Uh, oh, okay, I didn't mention something very important. Your uh, uh, postdoc research at NASA Scudder Space Flight Center. Um, he has been invited to lecture at prestigious universities such as Cambridge and Oxford, among others, and um, he has been interviewed in numerous um, international media. Um, huge, uh, strong online and social media presence, Twitter, Facebook, and finally, on a personal note, I must say that Nidal Gesum for me is a teacher in the full sense of the word, in the sense that um, he is very knowledgeable and he also knows how to convey this, this knowledge, and I hope this lecture will be as inspiring for you as Nidal Gesum's friendship has been for me over the past um, eight years. So please join me in welcoming Nidal Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Good evening, bonsoir. Um, I am a bit emotionally shaken after this introduction, so I hope I don't lose my footing. Um, I tried to not to lose my footing because of the snow, since you warned me this morning to be very careful. But now you have put some other snow under my feet. Um, I am absolutely delighted to be here. Um, we always start by saying delighted, delighted, but I am truly delighted to be here. Uh, I have been to Ifran. Many t several times since over 20 years ago, I have visited AUI for one afternoon, an absolutely great, uh, fantastic afternoon. And uh, when uh, Stefano, my dear friend, uh, proposed and worked so hard with the help of our common friend, Omar Iraqi Husseini, on trying to bring me here, uh, I, of course, immediately agreed and hoped that this would materialize, and it has, uh, because this is a great institution. This is one of the beacons of liberal arts education, as we will be discussing in a short while. Uh, when I received the letter of invitation from the president of AUI, I was very, very honored. But at the same time, I was a bit, um, how shall I say, uh, alarmed. Because I had suggested, at the request of my two good friends, I think a good half dozen topics uh, they said, just so the president and the VPAA and the deans get a chance to, to uh, select any interesting topic, and they ended up selecting this topic, which is the one that I have lectured almost, uh, not only the least, but very, very rarely upon. And so I thought, oh my God, um, what shall I do now? This is a topic that you will see immediately is a topic that is very dear to my heart and mind. 
Um, but it is not a topic that I am particularly expert on, and I have worked on, as I will explain, but have not given any such presidential lecture about. So I beg your indulgence and your forgiveness if I do not deliver a very highly polished and impressive lecture for this. I should stress, however, before I begin, that I am absolutely overjoyed at the number of students who are attending here. You are the reason why we do this. You are the reason why we perform all these activities, academic and non-academic, non including my Facebook and Twitter and YouTube activities. And you are the hope. And this, as you will see at the very end, is I am absolutely convinced the hope for the Arab world and for the rest of the world, this kind of education. So with that, uh, let me begin. A quick personal story and experience with liberal arts education very briefly is the following. When I got my baccalaureate uh, in Algeria and I was in the math and physics uh, path, which meant already in high school, uh, in the baccalaureate, I was not tested on history, geography, uh, and other topics because I was going to be a scientist. And when I entered the university, I was absolutely floored, alarmed, shaken that this university is the University of Science and Technology in Algiers, has absolutely no relation with humanities whatsoever or social science. In fact, the College of Humanities was something like 15 or 20 kilometers away. I went back to my father, I remember that evening. My father is now a retired but still active philosopher and Islamic theologian. And I said, is there any way I can take some philosophy and psychology courses, which were the courses or which were the topics that I was reading most often about in my spare time, even though I was excelling in mathematics and physics. I ended up being a physicist, an astrophysicist. I have not regretted it one iota, but I, I for, the for the rest of my life, regretted that I never got a chance to take a single humanities or social science or even writing course, as I will be stressing a little bit later. Um, afterwards, because fate has this kind of um, uh, winding road, as we say, it took me to the American University of Sharjah where I thought this is it. And at the American University of Sharjah, which is a liberal arts institution, I have been now for almost 18 years, even though previous to that I, have, I had never stayed in one place for more than five or six years. So that says that I have found a place where I was finally comfortable. Uh, I could attend seminars, I could talk to colleagues who were philosophers or sociologists or um, linguists or whoever, which I did not have before. What is this liberal arts education? I find even in my own university, even with many of my colleagues, a uh, large confusion about this liberal arts. First of all, there's the word arts, which tends to be a bit confusing. And then there's the word liberal, which makes it a bit suspicious because hmm, you're liberal and you're American, huh? Uh, so that's, that's the impression that we tend to get when we explain what is this American University of Sharjah. Uh, so this is the Encyclopedia Britannica. I don't think I can find a more robust or rigorous definition or, or uh, resource. And it says very simply, it is a college or university curriculum aimed at imparting general knowledge, this is the key word here, is general, and developing general intellectual capacities, this is the second key word, capacities, in contrast to a professional, vocational, or technical curriculum. If you do not, if you promise not to say, they mean French. In contrast to the French system, but we'll be coming back to that. So that's what is meant by liberal arts education. What does liberal then mean? Liberal comes from liberalis in Latin, and it means related to freedom is what it, is what it means. More precisely, it means what a free person should know, should learn, should acquire in order to take an active part in civic life, Participating in public debate, in political life, voting, running for office, etc., defending oneself in court. So, if you are well educated, if you can express yourself well, if you have well organized thinking, etc., then you can play that role. 
serving on juries, and even for military service. I would like to give you a brief history of liberal arts education before we start explaining why today liberal arts education is important. So let's go back a little bit to history. History is always instructive. Uh, by the way, even when I teach science, every time I teach science, even advanced science, modern science, electricity and magnetism, astrophysics, there is always in my, in my courses, all courses, a short, brief history of the subject. Because we do not understand the theories, the models, the current knowledge, and the questions that remain if we do not know where that knowledge has come from, how things have evolved, why do we think what we think today, what we, why we think we know what we know um, uh, if we do not understand the historical development of all that. So, the Greeks built the educational curriculum on two groups of arts. The trivium, which is the core of the liberal arts, grammar, rhetoric, and logic, and you immediately notice that these are tools, which means you learn the tools. You don't learn the subjects and the information, the knowledge. You learn the tools, that's the basis. That's not only the basis, it is the base on which we need to build. Then we build on it a quadrivium, which is the secondary group of arts, arithmetic, geometry, music theory, and astronomy, meaning the knowledge of the world around you. Notice here also that you do not learn knowledge of subjects that are about daily life or about your careers or your profession. You learn about the world. That's, that's how you become an educated person. Now, later in Europe, specialized training was undertaken. So further steps later, if you wanted to become a medical physician, or you wanted to become a military officer, or you wanted to become a, relig a religious uh, uh, a priest or a chaplain or uh, such, you would undergo or undertake further training a few more years in order to now take on a profession, take on a career. But before that, every educated person had to go through these seven arts. The Islamic era saw the establishment of major universities. I deliberately put the word universities in between small quotes because there's the whole debate over what is the definition of a university. This is not our topic for today, but uh, there is a whole discussion in history at what point can we call a university a university. But I had to at least mention Qarawiyin being here, of course, uh, not just to please my hosts, but also because it is the oldest university still running. Uh, there was also Al-Azhar. Our Egyptian friends tend to often say the oldest university, which we know it is not, but it is one of the oldest, and that's perfectly fine. Nizamiya in Baghdad, a little bit later, and in Al-Andalus, a number of madrasas, or mosque-based learning centers, which again, we cannot call universities for various reasons. In particular, because during the Renaissance, Europe established liberal arts universities because they were based on the previous uh, system that I uh, outlined, with two very important developments, which in my mind really defines the university. One is autonomy, and two, a set curriculum. Once you have a set curriculum and people who enroll come into that institution and graduate are all taking the same curriculum and taking the same exams, then you can call that a university. But if you have an institution where people come in and every year they find different people teaching different things and every master, let's call him, most always him, a professor, would teach whatever they want, uh, then that is perhaps a pre-university uh, or a prototype, not even a prototype, a precursor to university, but not really a university. But we started to have universities in Europe with that definition in Paris, Oxford, Cambridge, Padua, Bologna, and many of these places. In England and Scotland, the liberal arts tradition continued. In France, we start to have a big break and a big change of direction with Napoleon creating Les Grandes Écoles, 
Les grandes écoles, as you all know, and they continue to today with a huge prestige, are the places where the real professionals are trained, whether they're going to be civil servants, or they're going to be engineers, or they're going to be ambassadors, or they're going to be uh, of some specific professions. And those, of course, were not interested in knowledge of uh, general knowledge or general tools. They had to be trained for specific purposes because the state needed them. And so that is a completely different model uh, that um, other regions of the world, particularly in Africa, followed for colonial reasons and other reasons and linguistic reasons. But we need to be cognizant that this is a completely different model. The French model of grandes écoles to which the universities, which became sort of second class grandes écoles in France, also followed more or less. Uh, but elsewhere, particularly in England and in Scotland, the liberal arts tradition continued. In Germany, we have the emergence of the research university. Uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, very famously now even, in fact, the model is called the Humboldtian model of higher education or university, where von Humboldt uh, saw it important to marry in the same university top research and teaching. And so for the first time now we have a university where the production of knowledge is at least as important as the transmission of knowledge. And so the professors were expected to produce knowledge and in fact when things were taken to some extreme and this still exists in some top universities in the world uh, the professors are almost entirely researchers. And they are almost devoid uh, or uh, exempt from teaching duties. They might teach one course that they might like that is really whatever research they are doing just to attract some more students and things like that. So the research university started out with sort of a, a combined model of teaching and research and then slowly became with the R1 model in the US the sort of solid, high-caliber uh, high research, much more than teaching. Uh, to continue and try to sort of complete the picture now of this brief history of liberal arts education, the liberal arts tradition today is most often associated with the American university. And that's why you have these American University in Cairo, American University in Beirut, American University even in Paris nowadays, and American University in many places, um, because people now use the word American as synonymous to liberal arts. What is this American system of higher education of the university, the American university, uh, at least the liberal arts uh, form of it? I've already said that there is now a research university, the R1 and even the R2, which has taken a slightly or significantly different route. But by and large, the liberal arts universities are based on the following parameters or following uh, uh, characteristics. One, unity of knowledge, that knowledge is all interrelated and all, and all uh, held, holds itself together. You cannot fragment it. Uh, broad education, the students must come in and get some broad education of some percentage. Nowadays it is roughly one third which is general education curriculum. Individual choice, this was the main introduction by the American liberal arts model, that the students should be given and be encouraged to make their own choices, at least among a menu of courses, to choose what they are most interested in. So that's an, an, a novelty. And then close interaction uh, by two ways. One is among the students, because very often they live in residence, as is the case to a large extent at AUI, for example. At AUS, where I am, about half the students live on campus and half uh, live outside, but they get a lot of uh, opportunity to interact. And so that close interaction is seen as an uh, integral part to the education. And secondly, by making the, the classes small, uh, and I was very happy to hear this morning from VPA Masari that you, as in my university, the student to faculty ratio is about 15 to 1, which tells you that you get this 
uh, opportunity for lots of interaction. The classes, the courses are, are small, and so you have a lot of uh, question and, and interaction. So the above features represent the advantages of liberal arts education and the reason for its continuing su success I will be mentioning shortly that there is a renaissance, so to speak, a re-emergence of this model throughout the world. Now, why liberal arts education in the 21st century? Why the question to begin with? Why the why? Because the professionalization of education has made such inroads that people now see it as a uh, strangeness uh, to ask engineering students to take one-third of their credits in humanities, philosophy, God forbid, uh, or social science, or even writing. Um, and so because people have become so convinced that education should be for utilitarian purposes, for immediate benefit and immediate usage, then we need to ask, why then is this model uh, we are convinced I'm happy to be talking to a, uh, to a convinced audience. I'm sort of preaching to the choir here. But hopefully I'll be giving this uh, lecture elsewhere in the future and I'll be uh, challenged a lot more. Um, first of all, students who enter the university in 2018 will be born in the 21st century. This is the first time, perhaps last year a few, but this year, and from here on, everybody who enters university anywhere will be a 21st century person. Yes, sir, yeah, so what? Um, these youngsters grew up with the internet. They are, as we call them, digital natives, and have lived with smartphones, uh, meaning that for them, information is available anywhere, anytime, all of it. Even the stuff that is not supposed to be legally downloadable, we all know you all download. Which means you really believe that it should be available. I have lost count of how many people have asked me where they can download my book for as a PDF. Because they assume that that's a given. The book should be available for PDF. And I say, no, there are copyrights. If I do that, then no publisher will publish me in the future because they will have sold very few copies of my books. They don't understand the logic. And then they have grown, not just with the internet, they have grown with Internet 2.0, which has pushed them to be creative. Internet 2.0 means YouTube, means you contribute to the content yourself. Every individual is able to contribute to the content on the internet. It used to be the big websites and the big institutions. Now, every single person you open your, maybe right now people are, are tweeting and are sending stuff and are uploading. Uh, and so this has pushed youngsters to become more creative. They want to produce content. They want this content to be seen, to be downloaded, to be viewed. It's all measured in the how many likes and how many retweets and how many views. Uh, but that has its positive aspect because people are now more and more creative in producing content. Students, therefore, today need not be given knowledge. The knowledge is available. It's out there. They need to be trained how to think properly critically and creatively and to communicate. So it's about how to deal with the knowledge that is available, not, not where to get the knowledge or where is this master who's going to give me the knowledge. The educational paradigm has changed and most of the world has not, has not realized. So that's, I think, is the main reason for uh, why liberal arts education is a must. But I will try to convince you some more. The American Association of Colleges and Universities surveyed employers in 2013, five years ago. 74% of these employers recommend a good liberal arts education to students as the best way to prepare for today's global economy. 74% they say, if you want to be a good global citizen and participate in global economy, go to a liberal arts university. It gets even more surprising. 70% wanted university to emphasize science and technology more. Please notice that this percentage of 70%, even though it seems high, is the lowest of all the points I will be mentioning. 75% of the employers wanted more emphasis on ethical decision making. 81% wanted more emphasis on critical thinking and analytic reasoning. And then the bombshell 
wait for it, 89% wanted more emphasis on written and oral communication. I'll let you take pictures of the screen, yes? <laughs> if that did not convince you, and maybe not all of you are convinced by the AACU, but I'm sure everybody will listen to Mark Zuckerberg, uh, who most people don't know majored in psychology and computer science at Harvard. And if that were not enough, he said about Facebook, Facebook is as much psychology and sociology as it is technology. Um, we'll come back to these famous people later. The value of writing. So we saw a moment ago that the employers believe that writing and speaking is the most important aspect. Actually, we receive that as a feedback at my university all the time, even in the, in the Emirates. They say, your graduates are really great because they can really communicate. They can write a report, they can make a presentation, etc. They don't say they can really uh, design a motor or something like that even though we have an engineering school, as you do, they say they really can communicate orally and in writing. Now, why is that important? Farid Zakaria wrote a book three years ago called In Defense of Liberal Arts. He says, the central virtue of liberal education is that it teaches you to write. You wouldn't think if you talk to anybody and say, what is the most important thing about liberal arts education? Why are you going to AUI? You wouldn't expect them to say, because it teaches me to write. But he says this is the central virtue of liberal education. Teaches you to write, and writing makes you think. Whatever you do in life, the ability to write clearly, cleanly, and reasonably quickly will prove to be an invaluable skill. Jeff Bezos, you all know, the founder and CEO of Amazon, asks his staff to write memos before meetings. So before they go to meetings, he says, Write down whatever your ideas are, whatever you're going to bring to the meeting. Write it down in a memo. Then they get together, share the memos, spend 10, 20, 30 minutes reading everybody's ideas and thoughts, then we discuss. Why? Because once you, have, once you are forced to write your ideas, then you think more clearly, you organize your ideas instead of coming to a meeting and just rambling. Now, uh, Norman Augustine, the CEO of Lockheed Martin said, I have concluded that one of the strongest correlations with advancement through the management ranks, if you want to climb the ladder in any big company, what you need most, or the biggest correlation parameter, is the ability of an individual to express clearly his or her thoughts in writing. Now, I want to show you a brief video. It's only a minute and a half. This is Jordan Peterson. Is a psychology, clinical psychologist in, uh, in, uh, in Canada, a bit of a controversial figure because he's a bit slightly right-wing and keeps uh, attacking you know, all the political correct uh, ideas and he has a problem with the left wing of, of academia. Anyway, and a very interesting person. I just would like you to hear, uh, if I can get this to run. why they should write something. It's like, well, you have to do this assignment. Well, why are you writing? Well, you need the grade. It's like, no, you need to learn to think. Because thinking makes you act effectively in the world. Thinking makes you win the battles you undertake. And those could be battles for good things. If you can think and speak and write, you are absolutely deadly. Nothing can get in your way. So that's why you learn to write. It's like, well, I can't believe that people are just told that. It's, it's, it's like, it's the most powerful weapon you could possibly provide someone with. And I, I mean, I know lots of people who've been staggeringly successful and watched them throughout my life. I mean, those people, you don't want to have an argument with them. They'll just slash you into pieces. And not in a malevolent way. It's like, if you're going to make your point and they're going to make their point, you better have your points organized because otherwise you're going to look like and be an absolute idiot. You are not going to get anywhere. And if you can formulate your arguments coherently and make a presentation, if you can speak to people, if you can lay out a proposal, God, people give you money, they give you opportunities, you have influence, that's
that's what you're at university for. So that's what you are at a university for. To be able to write, to speak, to uh, convince, influence people. He says, God, people will give you money. They'll give you opportunities if you can do that. And I don't understand why the universities don't, don't tell people this is why you should write. Writing is thinking. That's the message. Um, no, I'll need to skip this. Um, other great values of liberal, uh, liberal education. It is not just about writing. The value of speech, which I'll remind you, the Greeks had started by putting rhetoric within the trivium. There's a reason for that. Farid Zakaria again says, the second great advantage of a liberal education is articulate communication. Uh, since I'm, I don't have that much time and I still have a few things to show you, I'll just pass on this. The value, there is another big virtue, and that is the value of learning how to learn. Learning how to learn. Learn how to extract information from a speech, from a text, from a book, from anything. How to analyze content. Detect fallacies and flaws in arguments, and God knows how much we need this today. Uh, Drew Faust, president of Harvard University, uh, said, liberal education gives students the skills that will help them get ready for their sixth job, not their first job. Uh, it is estimated that in the global economy of today and tomorrow, a typical employee will change jobs between three and six times. Which means you're going to have to need to readjust, to retrain yourself, to learn new skills as you go. It has been estimated that 60% of the jobs of, I don't know what it is, 20 or 30 years from now, have not been invented yet. Which means we can tra train you for them. We can only train you to think and to learn properly, then you'll be ready for anything. Okay, but what about science? It's like, yeah, 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 this is good, writing, speaking, etc. How does that help me if I'm a science or an engineering major? And I'm sure there are many in the audience. So yeah, 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 okay, liberal arts, you've convinced me, is very good for reading and writing. How does that help with science, right? Uh, Thomas Sech or Czech, or depending on whether you like football or not, uh, pronounce him differently, is actually a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry from University of Colorado at Boulder, um, went to a small liberal arts college for his undergrad, then went to Berkeley, and he writes in a beautiful paper titled Science at Liberal Arts Colleges, A Better Education. So he is even asking or putting out a thesis that maybe going to a, a liberal arts a, a college gives you better science education even prepares you for even being better. Is, could, could that be? So he asked. And so he tells the story at the beginning in his introduction that when he and his wife, the uh, young woman that he had met and just married, and were going to graduate school, he said, we were going to Berkeley scared to death, that we're going to this top, top university, and who are we? We come out of this little liberal arts uh, uh, school, and we want to major in top science he ends up with the Nobel Prize. So that's sort of the uh, uh, bottom line. But here's the, I hope you can read this table. Everybody, more or less? So this table, uh, as it says at the top, top 25 institutions in terms of fraction of undergraduates who go on to receive PhDs in science and engineering. The table is a bit dated, and the paper is also a bit dated, and I hope somebody will go back at, you know, sometime soon and update all this data, but at least it gives you an idea. This is not you know, medieval uh, uh, information. This is about 20 years ago. So they're looking at, at a given school, let's say AUI, how, what is the fraction of the students from AUI who will later go on to get a PhD in science and engineering? And they compare, they compare, R1 top universities, MIT and Berkeley and Stanford and you name it, with schools that I'm sure most of you have never ever heard of. Some of them, some of those that are on the list, I personally had never heard of until I read this paper a couple of weeks back. 11 of the 25 on this list are small liberal arts colleges. 
including, as you can see, for example, Swarthmore, Carlton, Reed, which are number four, four, five, and six on the list, much higher in percentage than even Cornell, Stanford, uh, what else, Yale, uh, even Harvard and Princeton. M meaning that these small colleges are very good at preparing their students to go to whatever universities, get a PhD in science and engineering, and in this particular case, go on to receive the Nobel Prize. Um, <clears throat> so, we should not be too surprised that there is uh, now a re-emergence of this liberal education model. In the last 10, 15 years, there have been dozens of universities around the world, from uh, Central Europe to the Middle East to uh, the Far East, that have opened up on this very model. And of course, as in maybe more than 10, 15 years, but even in Morocco. Um, why is that? Because many educators and many policymakers have identified the need, have identified two issues. One is we need to diversify the, the educational landscape everywhere. People should be given the choice. Students should be given the choice. Parents should be given the choice. There should be opportunity for, as there is in the US, liberal arts colleges, big universities, and anything in between. That's one. Number two because people have started to notice that the Central European model, the French model to name it, uh, carries with it some big flaws. What flaws? Um, that it leads students, it forces students to make choices very early on. Uh, the students who come to me in, uh, at AUS and they start asking me for advice, I tell them two things. I say, first of all, don't make up your mind before at least the second year. Don't. In fact, some students come to me and they are sort of apologetic that they are undeclared major. They have not declared their major. I say, bravo, good for you. You are open, hey, experience, talk to everybody, knock on doors, sit with professors in their offices, we are here. You have no reason to choose very early on. Second advice I tell them is follow your heart. Don't listen to your parents. Do not. Listen to your parents. Listen to your heart. Whatever you love, you will pursue as a passion and you will then excel in it. If you follow something that somebody told you to follow and then after several years you got totally bored, didn't like it, hated it and never told anybody, you will never be excellent. There's no way you can be excellent when you hate something. Uh, so people have noticed that there are, there are dropout issues and uh, loss of time uh, by students who are forced to make early choices uh, because in those systems, as I said, it is the anti-American system. You do not make choices. When I, took, when I had my four years of physics uh, at the University of Science and Technology of Algiers, um, I had zero choice on any courses, zero. Zero humanities, zero social science, zero language, zero writing, zero communication, zero choice even in the sciences, nothing. Um, very solid, very dense training, but I was being trained as a robot, to put it simply. Um, so not only that, but weak abilities to communicate, weak capacity for innovation, no interdisciplinary experience. I'll come back to this weak capacity for innovation a little bit later. So I want to ask now about our region or our part of the world. In 2014, 2015, I was honored to be the coordinator of a task force on science at universities of the Muslim world. That's me down there looking like a young student or something, even though uh, I am quite old by now. So that's me, but there are some illustrious people in the group. This is the task force. Uh, this person in the middle here is uh, Dr. Zakri Abdel Hamid, who is the science advisor to the Prime Minister of Malaysia. This was hosted in Malaysia. This is Professor Bruce Albert. Some of you may know. Bruce Albert is the past president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, former editor-in-chief of Science, the journal or magazine, etc. Uh, 
Who else? Oh, uh, here, Dr. Munif Zoubi, who has been, still is, the executive director of the Academy of Science of the Islamic World, and some others. So there are some important people in here. And so I, uh, maybe it makes sense that I look like a little kid in the middle over there. So we wanted to sort of investigate uh, how is science at universities of the Muslim world in various ways. So the issues that we wanted to check were how is science taught at universities of the Muslim world? It was very dear to my heart that we address science education, not just scientific research and etc. but how is science taught at universities of the Muslim world? Curricula, pedagogy, etc. Um, are universities helping improve science education at the lower school levels? We keep complaining, oh, it's the high schools that are producing these students who uh, have so many misconceptions. They cannot do this, they cannot do that. It's always the high school problem, fault. So are we doing anything about that? Are universities helping raise the general science literacy of the Muslim world? Not just at the university level, not just high school and, and middle school, but the general science literacy. I could give a whole talk. I'm not asking you to invite me, but I could, I could give an, a whole talk on science literacy and the culture of science. Um, what has been the impact of international university rankings? And then some special issues such as censorship, like evolution or other, the role of religion, academic integrity, etc. So you can see a whole full program and agenda. We ended up producing this report, which is available as PDF. This one is available free PDF online, as it should be, uh, to download. It has a report of about 25 pages plus a number, almost every task force member contributed an essay of about five to 10 pages. So the whole thing is about 120 pages. And uh, we ended up, uh, one of the conveners of the task force and myself writing an article about it. And one of the reasons I'm showing you this is because in Nature, is when it appeared, Nature, we did not ask them, Nature put a picture of Arawiyin um, on the first page of the article. Because for them, Arawiyin represents universities of the Muslim world. And we said, yeah, great, okay, no problem. Um, anyway, so, um, general assessment first. So what did we find? Very briefly, I'm showing you the work of 18 months and a long report in two slides, okay? So I'll go fast. Heavily focused curricula, not enough general education content, humanities, social sciences, languages, communication, etc. By and large, this is a bit general, generalized. But by and large, in the entire Muslim world, this is the uh, typical situation. In teaching science and in science majors in science fields, you get very little general education. There's a lack, even within the science, there's a lack of balance between pure science and applied science. The syllabi are heavy. We love to you know, put in stuff into our syllabi you know, 14, 15 chapters. If your syllabus has like six chapters, like, oh, you're cheating the system or something. I have always, since day one, and I have served even on, on commissions with ministries of education, I have always defended the light, the, how do you say, the lightening, the uh, uh, allègement of the curricula. Lack of internships, project-based learning, service learning, applications in local context, and inquiry-based education. So what did we recommend? So again, it's passing on all this and just giving you the gist of it. <coughs> to give more autonomy and flexibility to universities in designing innovative curricula and research programs. In other words, we were telling the Muslim world, let universities be free and approach curricula and disciplines and even research as they wish. Number two, adopt broad-based general education curricula, what we are now calling liberal arts, or what the world has been calling liberal arts, for students majoring in science and engineering. So we're telling the Muslim world, people were shocked when we came out with this recommendation, for students majoring in science and engineering, let them adopt, make them adopt the liberal arts model. Because, in simplicity, in one word, creativity. We don't want to produce robots. We want to produce thinkers. 
widen the skill sets of science graduates. They need to master at least two languages. They need to develop oral and written communication. They need to have some essential knowledge of the humanities, at least ethics, and you saw earlier the, uh, the, the employers were calling for more ethical education, history and philosophy of science, etc. And then reform faculty evaluation schemes to emphasize performance in teaching, quality research, and service and outreach. So I said there has been a re-emergence of this liberal arts education model. And I think there is now perhaps a new, new model that can emerge or seems to be appearing in the horizon. And that is uh, the Bologna process has indicated for Europe, and it has been adopted in places like Algeria, for example, the LMD system, licence, master, doctor. And it goes three plus two plus four or five for the doctorate. So instead of going with four years bachelor or five years engineer, they have recommended that everybody follow the three plus two. What, they, what the, <laughs> the Bologna process did not, did not indicate and did not recommend, not because they are against it, perhaps they did not think it through or nobody suggested it to them, is that the first three years should really be the broad-based education. And then you can use the two additional years, call them master or whatever you want to call them, I don't care. Those can be like the Greeks and the Europeans had done before, once you have completed your trivium and quadrivium, then you can go on to more professional uh, learning. So we could adopt this model around the world, in our region, in the Arab world, of three years of broad-based critical thinking, written and oral communication, et cetera, et cetera, and then add the two years uh, for students who want to specialize in any professional career or any professional discipline. Um, so this could be married, as I say, with the liberal education philosophy and could serve as a very good model where everybody would be happy or everybody wins. There is another thing that has emerged, started to emerge, and that is interdisciplinarity. One of the liberal arts education institutions that have emerged in the last five years only is Yale uh, and the National University of Singapore. The National University of Singapore is one of the top universities in the world. Yale is, of course, one of the top universities in the world. And together, they have partnered to establish a new university in Singapore that is liberal arts oriented, but sort of takes the best of both worlds. So it's liberal arts, but we will take all the rigor and all the hard work and all that stuff that you know, Singapore and the tough universities uh, of the Far East do. But here's the novelty. The novelty is they have realized that we need to get rid of the traditional departments. Gone the physics department. I wouldn't cry. <laughs> I'm interdisciplinary through and through anyway. Uh, gone the, um, let me try to be politically correct. Uh, any math department here? <laughs> anyway, so get rid of all these traditional departments and introduce new interdisciplinary departments and new interdisciplinary fields and majors. I will give you some examples, my examples, what I think could be a good idea. Need, we need to also integrate, this is the model, the new, new model, if you like, for the 21st century that I am sort of proposing, more or less. Need to integrate online learning and activity. What I mean by online learning and activity is two things. First of all, you are all fully aware that now online learning, the MOOCs, Coursera, etc., are slowly becoming an attractive source of education and training. And this is going to continue to grow, whether for profit or non profit. Some universities are doing it for non profit, some commercial organizations are doing it for profit. This is growing very, very fast. Very fast. There are millions and millions of people who just go on go to some of these websites and take this course or that course. Because they want to continue to learn, because as we said earlier, they have to prepare themselves for the next job and the next job. So we need to make sure that this online, uh, I don't want to brag, but I was, this was maybe seven, eight years ago, I was the first faculty member at my university to teach astronomy fully online. 
I shouldn't say fully online because the university insisted that the exams, the midterms, and the final be given in class. They said, otherwise, how are we going to check who's, who's doing what? But I never lectured to the students. It was all online, all the information, all the exchanges. I counted that on, in that semester, I wrote over a 1,000 messages online for the students, and that doesn't count their replies, etc. cetera. Uh, and it was a very, very interesting paradigm. And my justification to the university when I submitted the idea and when the dean took it forward to the Council of Deans, et cetera, and they said, why do you want to do that? The students are here. Just meet with them, lecture them. You're a good teacher. They like you. Why do you want to hide from them? I said, I'm not hiding from them. I want to prepare them to learn later when they don't have a professor next door. And even the students, they, came, they started coming to me and say, they are telling us that you are offering a course online, but you are here, so what's the story here? And I said, the story is tomorrow you're going to be taking a lot of courses online on your own from your bedroom, and I just want to train you for it. Um, and what I mean by activity is a lot of what we do, even inside universities, is now web-based. We all have these blackboard uh, systems, course management systems, etc. And so a lot of online activity has been integrated into our teaching to begin with. And so this has to become an integral part of our education system. Another idea that has been proposed recently is that students should be encouraged from day one to develop e-portfolios. These e-portfolios would be something that a student would start from day one, put in whatever essays, whatever design, model they have come up with, project, etc., but also their own reflections on their learning as they're going through different courses and then they're, they're writing. All of that will become part of their educational record and the employers would get access to it. And then they would see exactly who is this person we are hiring. So I think that is, this is tomorrow's learning, tomorrow's education. We have to really realize that tomorrow is not like yesterday. Um, so out with the old disciplines. I have no issues with that. In with new fields, like what? So let me give you some examples of what new fields, new majors, new even departments will look like in five years, 10 years, 20 years. There will be nanoscience. There will be departments of big data, artificial intelligence. There will be departments of global warming where you have to learn some physics, some chemistry, some environmental science, some modeling, some statistics, some math. Uh, and, obviously, some sociology, because there's going to be impact on populations, et cetera, et cetera. Digital communication. Uh, digital communication is inclusive everything. Health and environment. Biophysics, as the name indicates, or already existing, but already indicates interdisciplinarity. Sustainable economics. Uh, entrepreneurship, small and big. Uh, public service, intercultural engagement, and I was delighted to visit the interfaith um, uh, exposition earlier today. So that's intercultural engagement. Uh, but it needs to be developed into full programs. So I'm getting to, toward the end of my, of my talk, so we have to quote you know, the famous icons, right? especially when this is something that is relevant to our topic. Steve Jobs had this to say that I think is very relevant to what we just discussed. It is in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with liberal arts. And this is somebody who dropped out of university, by the way. Married with the humanities. That yields us the results that make our hearts sing. You wouldn't think this is the CEO of a, one of the biggest, now Google is the biggest, but one of the biggest computer software companies, right? Hardware and software. Reading this, you wouldn't think, you, if, I, if, I, if I had shown you this, there's the word Apple that gives it away a little bit, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't know who would have said this. Um, Here's someone else that many people don't know, Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba. Alibaba is the Chinese uh, uh, Amazon. Um, a few years ago, he wrote an article 
in which he asked himself and tried to answer the question, why is China not as innovative as America and Europe? He said, the Chinese educational system teaches the basics very well, but it does not nourish a person's complete intelligence and creativity. Remember earlier I said creativity is the key word. It needs to allow people to range freely, experiment, and enjoy themselves while learning. This is what I tell my freshman students, which their parents would kill me if they heard me say that. Go, you know, roam free, take courses, uh, enjoy your life. That's how you develop your creativity without knowing. In conclusion, Liberal education aims to develop a free person, this was the very definition of liberalis, a free person, an open and tolerant mind, and a lifelong learner, not a robot. That's what liberal education tries to do. In a time of conflicts and tensions, and with the looming threats of climate change, water wars, biological warfare, ethnic and religious wars, and God forbid runaway artificial intelligence, we are more than ever in need of liberal education. Thank you very much.